All right, we're recording. So on behalf of the College Assessment Council and SUNY Geneseo, we want to thank Dr. Kevin Gannon for joining us today via Zoom to deliver the keynote address for our Assessivist Conference. In all of today's Assessivist sessions, we'll try to wrap our minds around the ways our work as a college has changed in the last year, what has challenged us, how we've grown, how we can assess those changes. What have we learned that will influence how we do the work of the college post COVID? To help us think through these challenging questions, we've invited an innovative progressive thinker in higher education, Dr. Kevin Gannon to be with us today. Dr. Gannon is a historian by training, but he's influenced pedagogy across institutions through his leadership of Grandview's Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, his blog, The Tattooed Professor, and the publication of his book, Radical Hope, earlier this year. Nationally, he's contributed to CNN, Vox, The Washington Post, and Ava DuVernay's Oscar-nominated film, 13th. I'd like to thank the college for continued support of, of Assestivus, the College Assessment Council for their work planning and running these the events today and yesterday, and David Parfit for contacting Dr. Gannon and working out so many of the details for his appearance. There will be time for questions at the end of Dr. Gannon's address, and Dave and I will be moderating chat for questions. Now I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Gannon, who will discuss telling our stories in a post-COVID world. Thank you, Melody, and thanks everybody for being here uh, and for taking the time out of your day to come and talk about assessment. Uh, I think it's super cool that you have a thing called Assestivus, and it just makes me giggle every time I tell people what session I've been working on to, to talk with today. So. So I, you know, what that does to me is it tells me that, that you're in a, a culture, you're in an institution uh, that is putting some oomph behind what we normally just sort of pay lip service to, right? The idea that we are making promises to our students about how this higher education thing is going to be transformative for them, that they will change as a result of their college experience. Uh, but all too often, we don't know how to tell the story of that change. Uh, and students may not necessarily even know that they're changing as it occurs, right? And so how do we, how do we create a culture where we're able to do those things effectively? And assessment, as much as it's become a dirty word in some areas of faculty culture, is the way to do that. And so what I'd like to do uh, in the time that we have together this morning is to, to pose some questions, maybe some provocations a little bit. Some of those will probably affirm practices that you're already undertaking. Others, other questions may ask you to sort of think about things you're doing from a slightly different angle, kind of shifting the prism a little bit. Uh, but again, all of this is through the lens of, you know, oh, by the way, there's a global pandemic, right? And, and we know things have changed and it is seductive as it is to think about, let's go back to normal. You know, I think one thing that we've realized and certainly that our students have told us is that normal, whatever that was, uh, was not something that was equitable or sustainable uh, for many. Uh, for many of our students and for many of us, uh, our faculty and staff colleagues as well. Uh, and so as we talk about how do we tell the story of what we're doing uh, and in a more crass sense, how do we prove the value of what we're doing in a post COVID world? I think it is worth returning to some of the foundational questions that are guiding our practice uh, and maybe looking at them in a more critically reflective lens. So I'm gonna do the awkward transition to the share screen on Zoom here, so bear with me for just a second. So hopefully you see a, a title slide there about telling our stories in a post-COVID world. Um, and so as someone who is trained as a historian, um, I think a lot about narratives. I think a lot about stories. Uh, and in particular, the way that we put things into kind of a narrative or a story form, right? even the way that we think about our own history, our own past, we often frame it in terms of a story like we might read in a literature book with the exposition and the protagonist and the antagonist and some sort of narrative arc and climax. You know, it's people like stories. Stories are the way that we convey our experiences to one another. It's a powerful tool uh, and almost a universal medium of communication, however that story might be framed. And so for me, really what we need to think about with assessment is assessment is at root our story. Uh, and I don't mean to over it, you know, this is a simple but not an easy thing to think about, I think. You know, I don't want to oversimplify what it is that we do with assessment uh, because it can be very complex uh, and very diverse. But at root, we are telling the story of what we and our students are doing in this particular community. 
how we are transforming, how we are changing, how we are building in the time that our students share with and among us on campus. And so what is this thing then? What are these stories that we tell? Uh, and so I'll do the obligatory citation to people who write about assessment for a living and give you a big long definition of, you know, what is this thing we call assessment? And I actually, I do like uh, this, even if it's phrased a little bit unwieldy, I do like Huber and Fried's take on this idea of assessment because what they talk about is assessment as a process. Uh, and so maybe highlighting some of the ways that they think about that. All too often we think of assessment, and I'll say a few more words about this in a minute, but I think all too often we conceive of assessment as, you know, something we do and then it's done, right? That we talk about results and outcomes and deliverables. And certainly we need to talk about outcomes, right? What are the goals we're after? What are we telling students the end point of all this is? But even those quote unquote end points aren't the end of the story. And so what if we thought about assessment more as, as you know, some of the highlighted words here suggest, you know, a more process oriented endeavor. Because what we're trying to do is to tell the story of things like development, of culminating, of informing subsequent learning. You know, and if I could pick any random definition of assessment that would read a lot like this from the literature, from the articles, from some of the classics in the assessment literature. And what we would be able to do with those is pull out language similar to what I've highlighted here, process oriented language. You know, language that this is a continuing iterative and reiterative process where the story, to use the metaphor, never ends. Because there's always something coming up next, even after our students take a degree and leave us, right? Don't we often, you know, survey students after they leave us, did what you learned here help you in the why, you know, the quote unquote real world or your career, you know, things like that, right? There's always a next step. We are always in the process of becoming we're never quite there. And this is what we tell our students, right? Don't we tell our students when they come to us that we're gonna give you the tools for this sort of ongoing journey that is going to be not just your academic life, but your post-academic life as well. We tell that to our students, do we model that ourselves? At its root then, assessment is the story or stories of student learning. It's how we tell that story. And that's a really important thing for us to be able to do and to do well. Uh, in this landscape we're in right now, the news around higher education isn't that great. Uh, you might've seen in the Chronicle of Higher Education, for example, uh, if you follow Brian Alexander, a higher ed consultant futurist work, uh, he's talking a lot about this too. We're seeing a lot of studies coming out now that basically colleges and universities have been accelerants for the spread of COVID in their communities. And so what does this mean in terms of our institutional relationships with the communities that we find ourselves among? How are we seen by external constituents? How are we seen in the news? You know, are colleges nothing more than dorm parties and super spreader events? Or is there something else that we're about? We are in a hinge moment in terms of telling our stories about what it is that we do. Because if we don't tell our stories well, there are other people who are more than happy to tell them for us. And this predates COVID, but has accelerated during, right? Look at the literature, look at the discourse that surrounds what it is that we're doing in higher education, usually written by people who have adopted a critical outsider stance or a disruptor type of mindset popularized by Clayton Christensen in the Harvard Business School, for example. The story that's being told about higher education is that it somehow needs to end, at least in the way that we're currently thinking about it, that it should be disrupted that it should be unbundled, right? Let's take apart the component parts and privatize it, outsource it. Students should be able to course shop. And if there's a really good course from Yale on YouTube, they should be able to take that rather than the one at Grandview University in Des Moines, Iowa. Because after all, isn't this innovation as we define it, right? Privatization, market efficiencies, all these sort of neoliberal ideas that tell us these are good things that there is, in the words of former Prime Minister of Britain, Margaret Thatcher, no alternative. Why are you even bothering with this thing called higher education, right? The students who show up are just special little precious snowflakes who can't handle things that are outside of their bubble. They are, in fact, as Mark Bauerlein, an allegedly serious person put it, the dumbest generation. So people are telling our stories already. 
And that has had a disastrous effect. And it has had an often partisan effect as well. This is you know, the reality in which we live today, right? Some of you are probably familiar with this Pew study uh, that surveyed uh, partisan affiliation between Republican and Democrats, or at least leaning that way, and their views about the effect of higher education on the United States. And so we are at a point within the last year and a half where a majority, almost two thirds of those who claim affiliation with one political party in this country see colleges and universities having a negative effect on US society. What are we about? What do we do about that? How do we tell a story that pushes back against what I would argue is an extraordinarily wrong headed and disastrous direction for the narrative to take. And of course, that was all pre-COVID. How do we tell that story now when we're all scrambling just to try to figure out how to teach high flex or fully online classes? You know, when we've all had to learn way more than we wanted to know about the learning management system, about Zoom, uh, about trying to juggle both, you know, synchronous and asynchronous learning in digital spaces that never quite seemed to, to work the right way. How do we do that work? How do we change that narrative? Assessment is, I think, a, potential, a valuable potential tool for us to do this. If, again, we reclaim the power to tell our stories and to tell them well. And so as we think about the ways in which telling our stories to counteract this sort of flood of anti-higher education discourse, you know, that's so easy for the critics on the outside to write, how do we counter that narrative as those on the inside, those with the expertise, those with the contact with students who are our natural allies in all of this too, because they want the same things that we want. One of the ways that we ought to think about assessment then is how do we avoid weaponizing assessment? And by extension, how do we avoid coming up with the outcomes that we're trying to assess? How do we avoid framing learning goals or program outcomes uh, that are weaponized against students. And I use this metaphor from a digital activist named Cade who wrote about uh, digital tools that are designed to be weaponized. So think social media platforms, for example, where the designs of which either don't comprehend the amount of abusive or attack uh, sort of things that could happen. Think Twitter and targeted harassment, for example, or Weaponized design can also be systems whose user experiences directly empower those types of attackers, right? And so a platform that is allegedly neutral uh, is actually one that can be weaponized in particular against people who are already in communities that have been marginalized and weaponized against. Well, what if we were weaponizing assessment? What if our assessment cycle doesn't account for perhaps abusive applications uh, or at least implicit weaponization against students or particular groups of students. What if assessment is built on the premise that education, the way we talk about rigor, for example, is sort of the equivalent of hazing. So think about the course that's seen as the weed out course, and it's a sign of success that there's a high DFW grade rate in that course. Well, that's weaponized assessment, right? Because what you're doing is you're assessing how well barriers are put up to student success rather than any sort of selectivity in a positive sense for an academic program. Are the assumptions that we're making about what we're assessing, how we're assessing and what outcomes are worth getting to, are those assumptions weaponized? So is our very design, in other words, creating an environment for students where this is the implicit message. How many of our students come to college and experience our learning environments in this fashion? And I'd like to challenge us to think of learning environments as going beyond just the typical face-to-face -face or even online digital space or classrooms. Our entire campuses, physical or virtual, are teaching and learning spaces. We are always teaching, we speaking broadly, and our students are always learning. Students learn in the classroom, they learn in the learning management system, they learn in the library, but they also learn in the registrar's office, they also learn in the dorms, they also learn in the dining hall, and they learn all through our learning spaces. What are we teaching those students? Are we teaching those students that some of them don't matter? 
Are we teaching those students that some voices are more important than others? Does our assessment help us frame implicit assumptions about students that are pushing some to the margins? Because design is an important thing to think about. So you might recognize these figures if, you've, if you have a background or ever took a course in graphic design or even something like civil engineering. These are the designs that were popularized in a foundational textbook for design and engineering by Henry Dreyfus called The Measure of Man. As you can see here, it was published in the 1950s. And what Dreyfus did is he poured through uh, what he called a rigorous and thorough statistical analysis to come up with the mean, the average dimensions, if you will, for men and women. And so as you see here on the left, these were the dimensions, very intricate dimensions that he came up with. The 50th percentile of the data shows us that you know men have this characteristic, this set of characteristics, women have that set of characteristics. And this is what designers and engineers and others needed to be aiming for to suit the greatest number. Well, what about people who don't fit into that paradigm? Uh, Dreyfus had uh, an answer for that as well. If you design for people at the ends of the normal spectrum, he said, you're wasting your time, or at least that's the implication, right? that people you know, who are outside of that normal curve, he said, may be so extreme that an encompassing design could become too large or too expensive to produce. So Dreyfus's designs were adapted by engineers and automobile companies when airbags became a basic safety requirement for automobiles. And some of you might remember that when airbags were first a thing, that in accidents where airbags were deployed, women, whether they were in the driver or passenger seat, had a far higher rate of serious injury or death in airbag deployed accidents. And eventually, researchers found that the reason for that was because the dimensions that the airbag designers and the engineers had assumed women occupied were not actually the dimensions that women were physically occupied. They were based on Dreyfus's average which as it turns out, Dreyfus used data, physical data, but from army induction records. And so what Dreyfus was doing was surveying army induction records from the Korean War and coming up with his percentiles of here are the average height dimensions, et cetera, the 50th percentile of men and women. It was framed as a universal, but in actuality, this was an extraordinarily particular, somewhat self-selected group that was far from representative of the entire population. And because of this being seen as representative, when it really wasn't, in the case of early days of airbags, the result was literally life or death. And so that is weaponized design. The features, the way the thing is built, actively harms some of the users. And it doesn't even have to be life or death sort of decisions. It could be the ways in which technology aids us, for example, such as facial recognition software that tries to make it easier for us to take good digital camera shots. Who's designing these features? Who are the implicit people using or being used by these design features? Did somebody blink or is somebody Asian? This one will take a minute. One could make the argument that this facial focus recognition on the digital camera from which the screenshot is taken is working exactly as designed. It is picking up faces, but those were designed to be white faces that were picked up. And you could go on and on with some of the ways in which design has been weaponized against communities of color, for example. People with darker complexions whose skin does not trigger the automatic hair or hand dryer in a restroom, for example. What are the assumptions, in most cases, implicit assumptions, baked into the design of these things? And so if we think about this in terms of assessments, and we're framing outcomes, and we're collecting evidence to answer the question of how well or how completely did students meet this set of outcomes, are we doing the equivalent of trying to jam the square peg into the round hole? Are we designing things that create mismatches, 
as Kat Holmes, who writes about design and design justice, put it, mismatches are barriers to interacting with the world around us. They are a byproduct of how our world is designed. Mismatches are the building blocks of exclusion. So what happens if our assessments and the larger outcomes and practices upon which those assessments are predicated, the educational climate which is given shape to those assumptions we make about assessment and what's important to assess and what isn't, and what defines success and what doesn't, what if those are built in large part upon mismatches? And more importantly, who's being mismatched? So when Kat Holmes talks about mismatches and designs, think to some of the architectural features we've seen that are explicitly aimed against houseless people, people who are temporarily unhoused. So in, you know, park benches that have studs, metal studs on them so people cannot sleep on them overnight, for example. A mismatch, a building block of exclusion. And ultimately, a high enough degree of exclusion leads to in the literal sense, when it comes to our measurements, certainly in education, what Paulo Freire called dehumanization. Are we stealing humanity from our students? And when we look at this question too, as Freire points out, you know, the act of stealing somebody's humanity has an effect on those who are doing the stealing as well. Nobody gets out clean from this. The vocation of becoming more fully human what Freire talks about is sort of the overarching objective of what this education thing should be all about becomes distorted. That journey, that path, that process by which we become more fully human and see that as our vocation, see that as, as an innate need, as our ontological need, if you, if you will, becomes distorted when we do things like exclude, when we do things like create mismatches, when we create teaching and learning spaces, and this includes the assessment of those spaces that are exclusive rather than inclusive. And so many of you are likely familiar with the phrase, the hidden curriculum. You know, we have our, for, or our, 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 our formal curriculum, our explicit curriculum. You know, here are the requirements that you need to fulfill before you graduate. Here's your general education core. Here are the classes you need to take for a major. Uh, the formal curriculum for a particular class. Here's what you need to read. Here are the requirements that you need to meet. Here are the outcomes for this course as they fit into a major. You know, we're well familiar with that. We spend a lot of time thinking about and designing those curricula. But again, underneath that formal curricula is often a more powerful set of teaching and learning activities and outcomes, the hidden curriculum. And the hidden curriculum is what members of the, a teaching and learning community, not just students, but everybody involved in it, maybe primarily students. The hidden curriculum are those incidental lessons. In other words, they are often unintended. We don't mean to teach these things, but we are teaching these things. And those are lessons that are learned about things like power and authority, about what and whose knowledge is valued and what and whose knowledge is not valued. So let me give you an example of the hidden curriculum in action. We know from the research on class discussions uh, in class participation, that all instructors, white male instructors in particular, but all instructors tend to call on men more than women in a typical class discussion, even when the gender balance of that class favors women. In other words, is a higher percentage of, of female or female identifying students. We also know from research about class discussions that male students interrupt more, talk over other people more, or interject without waiting their turn and are rarely called out for that in a much higher proportion than female students are. And so for a class that sort of exhibits that classic bias, which again is often implicit, what are the women, what are the female identifying students in that class learning? They're learning about whose voices get heard and whose don't. And implicitly then they're learning about whose knowledge is seen as important and whose isn't, who has power and authority, and who doesn't? And the hidden curriculum is a thing. It is a thing on every campus or in every campus space across our country. If we are not aware of the way that the hidden curriculum functions, then students are learning things that A, we certainly did not intend to teach, and that B, often run directly counter to what it is we say we need to teach. And so what does this have to do with assessment? 
Well, if assessment is telling the story of student learning and telling it well, we need to understand that that story is also aimed at our students. How do students know that they're learning or if they're learning? How do students know if they're making progress uh, toward a particular set of outcomes? And if they understand that they're making progress towards those outcomes, can they tell us how they're doing so? What has worked? What has been successful? How are we assessing things? Do the assessment decisions we make empower learning or are they handcuffing us? Are they handcuffing both us and our students to a set of, of, of assumptions, a hidden curriculum, if you will, about teaching and learning that we either don't intend to teach or one that limits the stories that we and our students are able to tell. So one common problem that we run up against when we think about assessment then is this idea of construct relevance. And I would argue that, you know, even though we talk a lot about how construct relevance focuses on maybe a specific classroom assessment associated with one particular course, that you could actually scale up this concept and think about how it works on a departmental, a unit, or an institutional level as well. And so if you're not familiar with the phrase construct relevance, what it basically does is it asks us to ask this question. Are we requiring skills or students, excuse me, to master skills upon which we're not assessing them directly? So in other words, if we construct an assessment, what is it really assessing? What is it requiring students to do? So here's one example that would show up maybe on a, on a classroom type level. So in a mathematics class, if we're using word problems to assess students' command of particular mathematical concepts, that's not the, the ability for students to read fluently is not part of the learning outcomes that we have attached to that assessment. We're testing for understanding and ability to apply certain mathematical concepts. So the ability to read fluently is what we would call construct irrelevant, right? It is not part of the construct we're making in terms of how, you know, what we're saying we're trying to assess. However, we're not testing students on their reading unless we are, right? So are there students for whose difficulty with reading makes it hard to express the mathematical concepts that they actually know and know well? Students for whom English is not their native language, for example. Uh, students who, you know, so are we putting barriers in the way of students telling us the accurate story of learning? So when we make a word problem, we say this is one way that we're testing application of particular concepts. But what, what, is, what is it that we're really assessing here? And is everything that we're assessing actually relevant to the construct that we've made? All too often, many of our assessments contain actual tests or requirements, if you will, that are construct irrelevant. So think on a broader sense. If we have uh, outcomes associated, so at my campus, for example, we have outcomes associated with an oral communication proficiency that's part of our core curriculum. You know, we say that it's important for students to be able to communicate proficiency, in, you know, communicate proficiently in an oral way, right? To be able to give presentations or talks or things like that. But one of the problems that we have run into time and again is that the outcomes that we're assessing for that, the particular goals under this idea of oral communication are really loaded in terms of, for example, uh, cultural capital. So for a student who is a polished oral presenter, we're not assessing what they're presenting, we're assessing a polish, which is an extraordinarily subjective and culturally specific term and irrelevant to the idea of whether one can communicate effectively orally or not in many ways. And so are we assessing students' ability to, to put together an, an effective piece of oral communication? Or are we assessing the amount of cultural capital that a student has brought with them to college? Or the amount of external assistance that a student can get to complete a particular oral communication assignment? So for example, one of our classes that, that has this outcome requires students to record a presentation. So students who can get a really good webcam or have the hardware to be able to do a really good recording and maybe edit it a little bit are gonna perform better on that assessment most likely than the student who's recording it with a make do tripod in their smartphone. And so what are we really assessing? What is it that we're after? 
what are the constructs that we've made and what are the relevant outcomes to them? So think about student writing, for example. You know, someone who teaches in history, I grade a lot of written work for students. And what exactly are we assessing? If a student gets a paper back from me and there's a whole bunch of editorial comments and marks on it and feedback and things like that, does what I'm writing about to that student match the learning outcomes of the assignment? So in this example, you know, all too often what we're doing is we're not necessarily assessing writing and content, we're copy editing, we're circling grammatical errors. Here's a comma splice, here's this, incomplete sentence, awkward. And there may be a lot of that stuff that gets in the way in terms of comprehension uh, and distracting one's reader. But what if we told the students the outcome of this is? And then where are we devoting most of our time to actual assessment? One of the conversations that's occurring in the field of composition and rhetoric is a fascinating one, I think, about dominant academic English and the ways that students write with a particular voice or voices. The assumption that we might be asking some students to do what's called code switching. And then the construct relevance of things like you know, polish uh, and standard written English. What if we thought of dominant academic English as one dialect of the larger English vernacular, English language, of which there are many different dialects, right? And I think this might be a really accurate way to go about it, to be honest. And so here for a low stakes assessment assignment uh, in, a, in a really good article, by the way, uh, about a new paradigm for writing assessment, Nancy Eppinger Wilson gives an example of the journal guidelines that she uses here. The goal is, is for students to do metacognitive work, to do reflection, to do learning about learning. That's what she's assessing. And so here, she's making that clear in the assessment, right? There is an alignment. You know, the journals will be graded based on, you know, and here's the guidelines of evidence of the students' written or students' uh, process of thought. Edited standard written English is not required. The style must go for maximum self-expression. So here is an assessment schema for one particular component of a class where the outcomes are actually aligned with the product, uh, the process of assessment. And so whatever field you're in and whatever academic space you occupy, what are some of the ways in which we might think about does the assessment, do our everyday choices about the assessment mechanisms we're using actually reflect what it is we're trying to tell the story of? Student thought, student learning, students transformation through their journey, whether it's in an individual course or a larger program. And so it's worth going back, even if we have well-developed assessment plans, even if, you know, whether it's on the course at the departmental level, and asking ourselves then, what are we really assessing? And how are we going about that process of assessment? And so as a former department chair myself and someone who, you know, led a, a revision of our department's assessment plan, let me share with you some questions that I learned coming out of that process uh, and that the literature supports as effective ones for us to be what we might call critically reflective about the way that we approach assessment and more broadly, the way that we think about telling the story of student learning. So do our assessment plans talk a lot about deliverables? Students will produce X. Students will do X number of things. Students will score X percentage on the standardized exam that's necessary for licensure in this particular field. You know, all of those things are, you know, examples of what we might call summative assessments. And all of those are probably with, in accompaniment with other things, decent pieces of evidence for an assessment plan. But if our assessment plan focuses, you know, if we're telling the story of student learning or attempting to tell that story, focus solely on deliverables, you know, we're not assessing package delivery, we're assessing learning. And if we're telling our students that learning is a process, learning is a journey, but all we're assessing is summative outcomes, deliverables, we're not assessing that learning. We're assessing productions and deliverables, but we're not assessing the process of learning. And we might miss some really important parts of that story. Focusing so much on deliverables might lead to a, an assessment or a score that is the equivalent of a D plus. But does that count where that student started? You know, we miss that entire journey. We miss the process of movement, of becoming, if we're focused, if we equate outcomes and deliverables as the sort of sine qua non uh, 
of any assessment process that we undertake. And that's closer related to another question that we would do well to sit with. Are we conflating performance with learning? So in other words, is our story of student learning a series of snapshots of student performance? Do we have all our outcomes built in the back end? Uh, so again, an example from my institution, our old core curriculum, uh, which thankfully we've replaced, had 57 different learning outcomes associated with that. And I'm, you know, you're probably, your eyes are widening right now, like how the hell did you all assess that? Uh, and my answer to that is not well. Uh, but the assessment that we did do was focused on outcomes that were proven in things like capstone classes and 400 level seminars that were associated with the core. And so what we were doing was basically looking at student performance at the very end of their college journey and then assessing that, like, did you meet these benchmarks? You know, we had rubrics and that was basically it, right? We were conflating performance with learning. We were trying to make the case that students were learning things and see, here you go, here's a polished research paper or at least a semi-polished research paper. Well, that's just a snapshot. That's just you know a performance on one particular thing. That's not showing where the student started. And that's not showing the journey that that student took to this particular outcome. Uh, so is that really the story of learning we wanna tell? Is that gonna gauge how much a student has actually changed as a result of their collegiate journey? Now we would love if all students who finished a program in our history major, for example, could write you know, journal article quality research papers. Not all of our students are able to do that. And if we're just using that outcome as a measuring stick, then our department is failing. But we can't tell the story of learning, of student transformation, if that's the only measuring stick that we're using. And so I would suggest that we think of, it, of assessment as you know, falling on a spectrum between educative on one end and auditive on the other. Uh, and I would argue that we would probably want to err towards the educative side of this, right? Is our assessment, you know, if you know the difference between formative and summative assessment, right? Formative assessment is assessment that's being conducted, of course, so we can help folks do better on the next iteration of that particular task. Summative is that sort of high stakes, you know, here's how you did. Here is, quote unquote, how much you have mastered this particular content. And I apologize if I'm trotting, you know, familiar ground for you here. Uh, but is our assessment, you know, is it all on the summative side? Is it all just auditive? You know, we're checking off boxes. Okay, student can write an eight page research paper, check. They could use Chicago style, check. They gave a quote unquote polished oral presentation, check. Is that all there is or is it educative? In other words, are our assessment processes, whether again, it's on the course, the unit or the institutional level, encouraging students to, as we say in assessment, close the loop, right? Take that feedback, apply it to the next iteration and do better. And then be able to see how they did better. So one question I would pose on the individual course level is what happens when a student fails a test? Is that it? All too often it is. So if a student receives a failing grade, you know, a below 60, for example, what do they do with that? You know, oftentimes the assumption is, well, you failed this part, and so now we're on to the next chunk of the course, and I hope you don't fail that part too. But don't we tell our students that they should be able to learn from adversity, learn from failure? Do we model that? Do we give our students the opportunity to learn from failure? What if a student failed an exam in a course and then had the opportunity to go back into their course materials, find the correct material, correct the answers on their exam, cite where they got that material and how they found that material to correct their answers, and then wrote a brief reflection about, you know, these are the strategies that I adopted for this particular exam. Clearly they didn't work. So here's what I learned and here's what I'm gonna do differently on the next exam, both preparing and actually taking the exam. Well, what if we provided student and the students an opportunity to do that? What if they could earn back some points by doing that? So then failure doesn't become a door closed in their face, but rather a door they could reopen and go into the next space armed with a little bit more self-awareness, armed with some better metacognitive strategies and being told that failure is not the end point. You know, we tell students this stuff is important. It doesn't stop being important when you take a test, but you know what? The way we do exams and return grades 
that's kind of what we're telling them is that, okay, this stuff is over now. So is our assessment educative or is it audited? And let's think deeply about ways that we might move it towards the more educative end of the spectrum. And of course, as we do this as well, let's think about you know, who, is, who is asking the questions. In other words, who is asking the questions about what is important about this class, program, college, unit, whatever. And who gets to answer those questions and how do they get to answer them? So one thing that I would suggest that we, that we think hard about doing and intentionally about doing is how might we involve student voice in our assessment plans, in the way that we frame outcomes, for example, or in the way that we collect data. So this could look a number of different ways. Are we giving our students the chance to do intentional reflection in a course or at the end of a major, for example? Do we do focus groups with students? Are there collaborative ways in an individual class that we could work with students to not only go over, but maybe even establish the criteria that they'll be assessed on for a particular assignment? A really powerful discussion could be with this essay that we're writing, what are the things that should quote unquote count the most and why? What is it important for you to be able to demonstrate with this essay? And asking students what their perception of that is and maybe even incorporating some of that into our broader assessment of that particular item. What if we made things radically transparent? If we opened the hood for students and let them peek underneath to see how all of this works? When we have assessments, do we have that sort of thought exercise in our mind that if a student asks me why they're doing this, I've got a good answer for it? Why do we take exams? There are compelling pedagogical reasons to use exams as an assessment tool for a particular course or field, but can we articulate those to students in a way that's meaningful and that makes sense to them? If not, what are we gonna do about that? So bringing student voice in, implicitly or explicitly, and thinking about the questions we're asking in that light. But most importantly, I think, if we're gonna tell our story well in this sort of post COVID world, what is it that we're doing? You know, if all of y'all can go online this quick, then why do we even bother sending kids to campus, right? You know, how are we using assessment to, to provide a more nuanced answer to that question? And I would argue that we need to think of assessments as not something focused so much on outcomes that we're missing what got us to those outcomes. If we're so focused on outcomes, does it force us to see things in this sort of artificial binary of either you got it or you didn't, right? Like a multiple choice test, it's either C or it isn't, right? Well, what does that tell us about, you know, a student either knows this or they don't, right? And so if we're so focused on outcomes, if we're so focused on deliverables, we're just surveying students as they leave the particular assessment or their particular time with us. We don't have any data at all about what happened the entire time they were in that space. We just know what happened when they left. So what if we define the process itself as the outcome to assess? What if we came up with assessment plans and questions that focused on the learning process that build in not only checkpoints uh, that we can assess in a larger project, for example, but allow student voice to talk about in a metacognitive way, the choices they made, the strategies they adopted and whether or not those things were effective. So for an example, from my own field in history, if my students are doing a research assignment where they produce a paper or they build a website on a particular topic, what if what I'm really interested in is the question, how they formulated their research questions, how they went about finding the sources that they used and then critically evaluating those sources. How did they put that material together? How did they synthesize it into something that was their own scholarly voice as opposed to just a patchwork of excerpts from scholarly articles, right? What if the process itself was the main focus of my assessment? And what if assessment was then sort of an ongoing iterative and reiterative process throughout the course rather than a submission of a final assignment at the end? What if the submission of the final assignment was just the cap as opposed to the whole thing. What if I was focused on the process and assessing how students are changing as a result of this thing? So think of an individual course experience or a program as a transformation for students. We are telling students, you will be different as a result of this experience. 
you're starting this course here, but you're going to be over here by the time we're done. So what's that going to look like? How will you be different? What will you be able to do better than you are now? What will you be able to do then that you cannot do now? And how are you going to know how you're changing? How are you going to recognize that? I, to me, at root, the story of student learning is the story of process. How are we assessing the processes and the ways in which students are engaging with those? And I think this is a really important question or, 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 or consideration for those of us who teach in the liberal arts education environment, as y'all do and as, as my institution does as well. We have seen in recent times the truth behind this quote here, which I think is, is, is a really perceptive take. Uh, what do we value as a society? Right? We've seen, for example, that things like abstraction or nuance have gotten lost in the shuffle of our public discourse. We've seen that the type of critical thinking that poses big questions and sits with that ambiguity or recognizes that maybe there is more than one good answer to this question, uh, and we have to be okay with that. You know, those sorts of things have been de-emphasized in place of here are the answers. And this is why they're the answers. This is the way to light the truth and thou shalt not deviate, right? One could make the connection, as this article does, that, you know, is that a product of maybe our focus in higher ed on outcomes rather than process? What do we value in a liberal arts education? Is it the habits of mind? Is it things like thoughtfulness, abstraction, nuanced critical thinking, becoming rather than having fully arrived? What is it that we value? And are we assessing that? Are those things in alignment with one another? Does our assessment actually assess the things that we say are important, the promises that we make to students? Because we tell students, you know, we make a number of big promises to students. You know, our core curriculum, for example, might say you will become a more globally aware citizen. You will be able to think critically. You will be able to engage with perspectives and cultural backgrounds which are far different from your own. And then what are we assessing for them or, or to tell them they've met those outcomes or are meeting those outcomes? Is it single summative assignments or are we assessing the process? How do we know we're keeping our promises to our students? And again, we make promises to our students. This is your mission statement, or at least the one that's on your website. This is not an outcomes-based mission statement. These values emphasize process, right? You're inspiring students. You're advancing knowledge. You want students to be not become, but be, right? And I would argue that that difference, though subtle, is an important one. Students who are prepared for these things, right? How are you going to assess that? Are these things something that once you do, you're done? You know, I can check off a box that says, I am now officially prepared for life and success in the world. Check, I'm good. Or, you know, what's the threshold for being globally aware? Is there one or is it a process? I would argue that your mission statement, the promises you're making to your, as the business folks say, external stakeholders, are process-oriented promises. You have a vision statement as well. Uh, my university has a vision statement too. Uh, so you have a mission and you have a vision, which I guess is good. You wanna be two for two on that. So this is what your vision is. But again, this is a process. What threshold do you reach where you say, we have adequately demonstrated this thing? And right now, can we say, any of us who are liberal arts institutions, can we say that we have demonstrated this? I showed you a slide on you know, partisan perceptions of higher education's usefulness and purpose and effects on society earlier in this presentation. And that data suggests that we have fallen short of this particular assessment outcome. So do we have outcomes-oriented, deliverables-focused assessment practices that actually modify our mission? Are we assessing equitably and inclusively? Are we assessing some better than others? Have the outcomes that we have framed 
really talk about the process of learning for all of our students? Or are we assessing things like how much cultural capital our students brought with us? What zip code they were born in? How well resourced their high school was? What their major is now? How remuner remunerative, he said, their post-collegiate career path is? When we talk about these broad outcomes, are there implicit meanings? You know, socially responsible. We want you to be socially irresponsible. You know, not like you protest on campus or anything. Let's not get carried away, right? What are we assessing? How are we assessing it? And is it in alignment with the values that we have told our students, both perspective and actual, are important to us? Are we assessing our vision? What stories are we telling our students about their learning? and about what we think about them and their learning. Are we treating learning as simply transactional, check boxes, do your outcomes? You know, one of the things that bugs me about our core curriculum at my institution is it becomes very box checking. Oh, you gotta knock out this domain, you gotta knock out this iteration. We're talking as if I pulled the thing off the shelf in the grocery store, and now that it's in my cart, I'm good. Is learning transactional or is it transformational? And if it's transformational, how are we telling that story? Can we prove that the learning that students are engaging in on our, in our campuses, in our institutions, can we prove it's transformational? Or does all the data we have show simply the completion of certain transactions? So a couple of things I'll conclude with to suggest about what meaningful and equitable assessment for our post COVID world might look like. What are the qualities that assessment might have? Uh, and I would argue should have. And again, this will likely affirm some of the things that y'all are already doing. And I don't mean to, to assume that you're starting from scratch and I don't mean to assume uh, that you haven't had these conversations already. What I'm hoping is that this affirms some of what's already happening. But meaningful and equitable assessment for us to more adequately tell the story of student learning, we need to have reiterative, iterative and reiterative and varied assessments, high stakes, low stakes, summative, formative. How are we seeding this throughout our curriculum? Can we map where various classes in a major are hitting these outcomes and in what way are they doing so? Is the student's journey a complex one or simply a linear one? How are we doing that? Meaningful and equitable assessment needs to be mission driven. And again, this is the pro, you know, these are the ideas which we have publicly committed to as an institution. Have we met them? And if so, can we prove it and how? Are our values in alignment with what we're assessing? Assessment absolutely must be a conversation. It cannot be a diktat from above. It cannot be some bureaucratic apparatchik type thing. You know, we should, you know, when I started at my institution, I often felt like a mid-level Soviet bureaucrat trying to do assessment because all we did was curriculum maps where we were literally cutting and pasting things together. And then they were filed into a drawer and no one ever saw them again. You know, that's not meaningful assessment, right? Because that was a top-down mandate to do particular thing that didn't tell us anything about student learning. Thankfully, we have changed that. We have transformed assessment on my campus. And it is now a conversation. It's a conversation between all of us on campus, faculty, staff, administration, and most importantly, students about what they've learned, what learning is, and what their journey has been like. Meaningful and equitable assessment has to be construct relevant as well, right? We have to be assessing the things that we say we're assessing. So do we have unintended or weaponized implicit outcomes? You know, are we measuring cultural capital or are we measuring learning? Are we measuring superficial things like polish or are we measuring proficiency and mastery, right? Construct relevance is absolutely vital to be at the core of what it is we're trying to do. And finally, and most importantly, I would suggest that meaningful equitable assessment for our quote unquote new normal has to be process oriented. And sometimes the process doesn't go well. It's been really hard the last year to teach well in an online environment when many of us haven't had that experience. But what are we getting out of it in terms of assessment? If students have struggled as well because of this, that's an important story we need to tell to advocate for the resources for us to do it better, but also to support the type of uh, in-person teaching and learning that our campus has shown has value and that our students value, right? So this process 
whether it's a positive or a negative process. What is the process like? The journey to learning is never a linear one. Are we able to tell the story of that journey and all its complexity and all its twists and turns effectively? So in other words, is the process itself the outcome? And I would argue that in a majority of the cases, the answer to that is likely yes. And so how are we conveying that to? As we move forward into whatever uncertainty higher education faces in a quote unquote post COVID world, we have to make sure our new normal is not the old normal. The old normal was not sustainable for many of our students or for many of us. But in order to create a new normal that is sustainable, we have to be able to tell our story and tell the story of student learning well. Others are already trying to tell it for us. So how do we meet that challenge and how do we overcome it? Those are some thoughts about what assessment might look like in this new uncertain environment. And if you're interested in anything I linked in here, I did link some stuff. These slides are available. There's a bit.ly address right there. It is case sensitive. Um, I will also send this link uh, to Dave after we're done and you all should feel free to use any of this material in ways that you see fit. It's all Creative Commons licensed, so go nuts. Uh, and so thanks for letting me spend time with you today. Uh, I'm going to stop the screen share here in a second so I can see everybody again and turn things back over to Dave. Thank you very much, Kevin. I appreciate that. Um, an excellent presentation. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. Our session is scheduled to go to until 1210. I put a link in the chat there. Um, if everyone could take a couple of moments to complete this survey uh, we have about um, Kevin's pre presentation, as well as Assestivus in general, that'd be great. Um, let's open it up for questions. You can place questions in the chat, or you can go ahead and um, unmute yourselves, uh, turn your cameras on and, and ask questions directly. Um, and we have a quick question in the chat already from Michael Restivo asking about um, what your t-shirt says, Kevin. At least I'm assuming it's about Kevin's t-shirt. Yep. yep. So my t-shirt is actually the book cover for the original uh, publication of the Isaac Asimov novel Foundation. I'm a sci-fi and fantasy geek. Uh, hmm. It's from a place called Out of Print, which does really cool original edition covers and t-shirts and other things like that. It's one of my favorite places to shop. So if you're a bibliophile, uh, you'll probably spend way too much money with them, but, but they're a really cool business and they're all book lovers too. So Out of Print is what it's called. I've actually gotten some some shirts for my my daughters from out of print. I know it well. Alexis, go right ahead. They also have the original cover for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. If that's your cup of tea. Yeah. So excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I was just curious. So I, I'm engaged in that idea of inviting our students to help us be part of the assessment process. Um, building on some things that we heard from students yesterday that can be potentially an uncomfortable situation for them to be in or in uh, brand new. They may not know how to participate. They may be intimidated by participating. Do you have ideas for how to invite them seamlessly into that process? Yeah, that's a great question, Alexis. And, you know, we need to be mindful of that, right? Like our intent is collaboration, but we don't want to provoke, you know, anxiety or reluctance, right? And so, a couple of the things, especially when I work with first year students that I've found at least somewhat successful in mitigating that is I provide at least first an, an out of class kind of low stakes anonymous space for them to add their voice and feedback. So I'll pose a couple questions and then have them answer it anonymously either in our learning management space or invite them to submit things that go directly to me and that aren't publicly posted. And then I synthesize all of those into a document and put it out to the class. And so they see kind of what everybody's put uh, and how everybody's starting to think about a question, but they don't see any names attached to it. And then we discuss as a class. So that kind of takes that individual link out of it. But I think what's really important is for us to be really transparent about what we're doing. You know? And so if we say, for example, I want to collaborate with you on setting some of the expectations that you'll be graded on for this paper. So what do you, you know, I have to do a little prep work for that. I can't just sort of throw that out there. So I say, you know, all too often, you know, sometimes we get a grade on an assignment and we don't know where that grade came from, right? That's super frustrating. 
Uh, what do you think the important parts of this are? What do you hope to get out of it? Uh, one interesting tool to use on written work is to have a student in their written work um, after you've given feedback, reply briefly to that feedback and saying, okay, here's what I'm gonna work on for the next paper or the next assignment, and then include that in their next assignment. So when you assess this, here's what we said that I really wanted to focus on. And so now I'm helping that student focus it on a particular issue as well. So try to create the safe space to have that conversation in the really low stakes way, uh, but also being clear about why we're doing it. You know, what is the value of this? You know, we're not trying to do any gotcha but we are trying to avoid that all too common thing where you just look at a grade out of the side, but don't know where it came from and say, eh, we're done with this, right? We want more meaning out of that. And so being transparent about that is our motivation uh, could be a really useful thing to do, I think. Other questions. And while people are thinking and maybe formulating questions, um, feel free to use the raise hand icon in the uh, participants. There were a couple things that Kevin actually brought up that are going to relate to some future programs we have coming up um, in the Teaching and Learning Center. Um, Kevin, I really appreciated your, your talking about the implicit assumptions that are baked into the design of things like recognition software, things that we don't even really think about. Um, as part of our work in becoming an anti-racist campus, we are having a month-long series of programs on uh, in support of Black History Month, uh, one of which we are going to be doing a screening of the film Coded Bias, which talks directly about um, that issue that you were bringing up, how this facial recognition software is biased for uh, white people and oftentimes does not recognize uh, people of color. We're going to be having a screening of the film on February 18th as well as a talk back with the director um, of that film. Um, so I'd like to, uh, to point that out to people. And I'd also like to point out that Kevin himself will be coming back on February 25th. Kevin um, is one of the scholars that appeared in Ava DuVernay's uh, documentary film 13th that explored the history of racial inequality in the United States and specifically focused on the fact that our nation's prisons are disproportionately filled with African-Americans. Um, so that will be on Thursday, February 25th. Any other questions we have right now? Kevin, do you want to give us a little preview at all about um, what you'll be talking about when you come back to the college in February? Sure. I know, I know um, I'm springing this on you, but. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, what I hope that we'll be able to do is to have a really good generative conversation that grapples with, you know, stark uh, and frankly intolerable racial disparities and injustices that are reflected not only in our system of mass incarceration, but the way that those have spilled out into other areas of our society as well. I mean, we see very clearly you know, how policing in this country uh, tends to be weaponized against communities of color, for example. And what I'm hoping that we're able to do is to gain a better understanding of where we and our students are in relation to all of this, but also to realize that this isn't something that just popped out of thin air, that there's a long history and structures that have been built around it and what we need to be thinking about doing. And I think in higher ed, this is particularly urgent. How do we go about dismantling those structures of inequality, right? Because structures re reproduce themselves by default. And so how you, you have to actively intervene in that process of reproduction uh, in order to, to disrupt it. And so how might we in a college and university setting, working with the students with whom we work in the communities where we are, how do we begin that work? What does it look like for us to be doing that intervention and why is it such a, a crucially important thing for us to do? So I hope that we'll be able to have a, a rich conversation about that and then you know what that you know what that work looks like in our own particular context. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. One final thing, you talked a little bit about weaponizing assessment. So does this concept of weaponizing assessment, does that assume intentionality? 
it doesn't, although it often can, right? You know, sometimes I think when, one of the ways in which I see this happen the most is when we talk about things like rigor and challenge, yeah. right? Like what is academic rigor? And, and rigor, you know, no one wants to say that we shouldn't challenge our students, right? Learning is supposed to be challenging. You know, that's the whole point. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I get to the point where it's, if you say rigor, I think corpses, right? Like, because that's oftentimes where discussions go to die on things like, you know, because rigor becomes seen as, well, if a student didn't accomplish this particular thing, we're going to ask them to do the same thing again, but twice as fast or something even harder, right? Like we don't, there's never that opportunity built in for the formative part. It's always summative assessments and it's usually benchmarks to which students are falling short. So I think we do weaponize assessment a lot when we talk about, you know, if we conceive of courses as a quote unquote weed out course, you know, as a gatekeeping type environment, we're weaponizing assessment because we're using it to shut the door in the face of students, right? Is that really the thing that we want to be about? Is that the work that we should be doing? But then in other times, as you suggest, it is more of an implicit thing. You know, what types of assessments do we fall back on as kind of the tried and true methods in our discipline? And are those assessments that, you know, to use the idea of construct relevance, are we actually assessing students on the things we think we're assessing them on? You know, when we, so when we talk about things like polish, when we talk about things like professional, when we talk about things like that, right, those are very culturally loaded and, and oftentimes very specific concepts whose meanings we haven't made explicit. Uh, and so our students are trying to hit a moving target. We're assessing on a moving target. Uh, and, and that way leads to a lot of frustration uh, and cognitive dissonance uh, on the part of all involved. And so I think we need to be really thinking about, you know, pedagogy and assessment are not weapons, you know, they're tools. Uh, and, you know, a hammer is a tool, but it could be used as a weapon, right? And so I need to be, how am I using the tools that I have? Am I using them in ways that are constructive and building the things I want to build, or are they being wielded indiscriminately and actually doing damage? Well, thank you. I think you gave us all a lot to think about, Kevin. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us, and I look forward to you coming back um, and continuing some of these discussions as well. Our next presentation we have is starting up at 12.15. Uh, we are going to have a panel discussion about some of the surveys that were done um, during last semester. Um, these will be presented by um, our colleagues in institutional research, as well as the Director of Accessibility Services on campus. So once again, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and I wish you well in the snow out there in Iowa, too. Thank you very much. And thanks for letting me share the space with you today. I appreciate you coming and thinking about some good questions of assessment. Take care, everyone.